today because I you know mean got this cut so it's fresh cut and I'm feeling good so this video is just gonna make for a better video quick shout out I want to shout out this company right here LA African for making this dope shirt Africans make it happen uh, go follow them um, on Instagram I'll provide the probably the um, the ads the ad name in the description of this video cool so that was a short introduction if for y'all that don't know me, my name is Yofi Kwanzaa. This channel, like I said, is dedicated to an array of software topics, but, uh, you know, the, the sort of underlying purpose is to make practical sense of these software topics and provide real examples. So, you know, you can uh, sort of get knowledge into how these concepts fit in the real world and you can form your own opinions, which is the best thing, right? So without further ado, what we're gonna talk about in this lesson is caching. Um, we're gonna talk, about, well, this is gonna be part one of caching techniques. And uh, this, we're talking specifically about server-side caching. So the difference between server-side caching and client-side caching. So just a little background, right, is from a client, when a client makes a request to a server, right, uh, essentially, or ideally, the server would like to return a response to the client as fast as possible, right? I mean, that just makes for better user experience um, and just a whole lot of good things, right? Like, you don't want your client waiting around from a response from a server for forever. It just doesn't make sense. You need to um, be able to return the data to, as fast as possible to the client. Now, caching helps with this, right? Because caching... Um, is a technique where you reduce read latency from a client. Um, so when the client makes a request to a server, you're returning that data faster than if it were to hit disk. And what I mean by hit disk is go through a database, right? You know, because there's a lot of things that happen with connect to the database. There's, um, it has to, usually database talks TCP protocol. So I have to open a TCP connection and then uh, the data has, the data, the the server, the application server that's, you know, retrieving the data has to, you know, basically make some sort of IO uh, request to get the data and then return it back. Um, so there's a lot that's going on there and caching helps with reducing the read latency. Cool. So uh, without further ado, let's look at one diagram. I'm going to show some code and then that'll be about it for the video. So um, like I said, uh, this is sort of like a, at a high level, you know, I have this diagram. This is like regularly what happens, right? You have clients, which is, you know, your, it could be your mobile phone. It could be a website. It could be, shoot, it could be even uh, code, right? You know, your Python client, node client, whatever. And it makes a REST uh, API request to your web application, which is running on a server, a machine, right? On some sort of port. And then, um, this web application is responsible for retrieving or inserting data into the database. So this involves an IO connection, uh, or like I said, main, in most cases, a TCP connection to the database to basically communicate and retrieve data, right? Now this whole thing is actually another sort of application that's running on a server. And, you know, so there's a lot, th there's a whole chain of things that happen here, right? Now, like I said, you know, uh, I think I stated in a previous video about programming pessimistically, right? Like it, it, nothing is 100% programming, you know, and you have to account for all disaster scenarios here, right? So uh, with usually, I mean, usually your database should be highly available, but you never know, right? And it's web application too. Usually you should uh, sort of configure it to be highly available, but you never know, okay? So uh in a caching scenario how would this look so you have a client that makes a rest call to the web application now the web application before it's going to check database which you know like i said that's open tcp connection and then a lot of stuff has to go on it's going to check if this request can be served from the cache what that means is based on the client's request do i, do I have existing information in the cache 
if I have existing information in the cache, I'm just going to return it back to the client. If not, retrieve data from the retrieve data from the database, if not in cache, and send it back to the client. Okay. So that is sort of at a low uh, or sort of at a high level how this works. Now, the type of caching that we're going to be using is an in memory cache on the web application. Now, um, you're going to see how this works. Um, but I'm going to tell you now, this is not the end all be all solution. Like, um, you do not want to use an in memory solution for uh, your main source of caching. And I'm going to talk about that later. Okay. All right. So let's get into the coding portion now that we understand uh, the high level what's going on here. So I wrote some code here, which is just node code, node.js code. Um, and Basically, what this is doing is it's starting up a simple Express server, right? Uh, HTTP server, a uh, REST server built on Express, and then uh, it's listening on port 3000 and sort of constructing these routes for us to hit. So if you're familiar with REST for request, right? Um, what happens is uh, you you know you define uh, basically the HTTP verb and the path that you want to hit, and then you could specify parameters or whatever the case is, right? So, um, yeah, I don't want to get too much into this, but it's basically a simple uh, HTTP server, right? A RESTful server. Um, and I have three routes here. I have a put, a post, and a get. Uh, so the type of information that we're storing in this MySQL database is um, basically information about careers. Now, um, you would imagine maybe something like salary.com or something like that. Uh, they have information about careers. And this is sort of the schema that I uh, sort of crafted here is the career name will be the primary key, assuming that uh, no two career names are named the same, right? Uh, and then uh, we have info on the career, which is just, you know, uh, basically like a child table of this career table. It stores the career name and it references the career name from the career table. And then it stores the location and the min and max salary for that career in this location. So let's imagine the scenario, right? The scenario is that we have a website that's serving this information to the end user. So uh, our the client, the, the end user that we're targeting is people in looking for uh, career information and salary on that, right? So um, Basically, we are responding with the information that they're requesting. So they say, oh, you know, what does an accountant make in New York? What does a, a, um, a software engineer make in Seattle? Something like that, right? And basically, they're searching for this information. And this is the data that we store. And the contract that we maintain with the users is we'll return this information to you, right, based on what you request. So let's look at the get request, which uh, essentially is basically just grabbing a careers by career type, right? So the career type is going to be a query string here. And um, basically, it's going to be the name of the career. So whatever it's like software engineer or whatever. So to uh, save time, I've already preloaded my MySQL database with this data. Um, and what I'm doing here is I'm spinning the MySQL database, MySQL server in a Docker container. Right, so it's running locally on my machine, my machine in a Docker container, and this is sort of the SQL script that I wrote to create the tables, and uh, I have a Docker file that just basically copies this create SQL script into an entry point, uh, and this entry point is going to create all the tables as we spin up our MySQL server, right? So I've saved the trouble of of you know running these verbose commands for sake of you know brevity in this video, but um, essentially how I was able to spin up that server was with this command. So uh, our, first of all, I had to build the, uh, the, the Docker image from that Docker file, right? Um, and that just creates a Docker image for us. And then uh, to run it was this pretty verbose command. Uh, and I'll do more videos on Docker if you don't understand Docker, but essentially it's just giving it uh, a password and then exposing the port so we can hit it from our machine. 3306 okay so this is actually already running on my machine uh as this my sql challenge <laughs> uh <laughs> well, we'll see who knows about that so uh, 
Now it is running on my machine. So now uh, I I have code as well to ex essentially I have um, code to connect a, a node Node.js client Node.js MySQL client to the the database as well. Okay, so um, that's already hooked up and already preloaded this um, database with data. So let's run npm start here, which is going to run Nodemon. Uh, listening and Nodemon just listens for any changes and restarts the server, which is going to be important in, in, in about a few minutes. Okay, uh, once we talk about caching. So, um, this is pretty simple right here. Uh, if I want to request for career type of doctor, this is just a request to request for that. And then I preloaded it, like I said, uh, doctor in Los Angeles, 170,000, 500,000 doctor in London. Um, 40k. Actually, I learned that doctors, I don't know, somebody can recommend if I'm wrong, but I, I looked and then doctors don't make too much in London, which is kind of weird. I don't know. But anyway, and let's see, accountant. So I have an accountant in New York and in Miami, and then I have the software engineer, which I have LA and New York. Um, and this is, these are just random numbers, but uh, you, you can imagine. I'm pretty sure New York software engineers make more than LA, but whatever, right? And this is all coming from our database. This is all, so this is following the pattern of this right here. We're not caching yet, right? Uh, we're not caching yet. So this is just following right now. It's just following this first pattern right here, right? That is just hitting straight the database and we're not caching yet, okay? Um, like I stated, so um, I want y'all to pay particular attention to the latency here, right? Which is 42 milliseconds from, you know, when we initiate the request and we get a response back to the client, the client in this case being Postman, all right? So because, you know, that extra latency, if we sort of make this request, we see that it's on the order of, you know, it, it gets smaller and smaller, um, maybe because of caching on the MySQL server side but um we see the latency was uh pretty high uh initially right so let's use the in-memory solution all right so um let me explain exactly what i did uh to create this sort of in-memory cache right so what i'm doing is i'm using what's called an lru cache all right so this is just uh, a package that you can install with npm but uh, this LRU cache is basically an in-memory data store that you can use to store elements and cache elements in your application. Now, like I said, there's some dangers with this, but uh, essentially it uses what's called an LRU algorithm, which stands for least recently used algorithm to evict items out the cache. Now, uh, why would we need to evict items out the cache? Because your cache can't be unbounded in your application. Now, why is that? Well, there's memory implications, right? You can't just hold an unlimited amount of data in your application. That just ruins, uh, you know, memory resources on your application, right? So essentially what we're saying is there can only be 50 keys in this LRU cache. Now it's a key value storage, right? And um, if we want to store data past 50, we can't do that. We can't store 51 elements. What's gonna, gonna have to do is evict an item out the cache and then uh, store another item in the cache based on the least recently used algorithm. So the least recently used piece of data is gonna get evicted and this new data is gonna come in. All right, I'm gonna plug in my charger real quick because I see my computer is dying a little bit. Okay, so uh, I just create this new cache and then I store, um, or I just create this new cache and I, exp I export it out this module. Now in the get uh, operation, so this is the request handler for the get request, which is what we're making, right? Uh, what I'm doing here is I'm protecting this with an environment variable, you know, the caching logic. So uh, essentially if this is set to true, uh, what's gonna happen here is we're gonna use the cache, this in-memory solution, right? And uh, what's gonna happen here is it's gonna, uh, Basically, we create a cache key and I do this little um, dumb little function right here to just create a key for us. And then um, it's gonna check, hey, is this value in the cache? If it is, 
we're going to return it as a JSON parse value. If it's not, you know, we have a cache miss here. And then we are going to basically uh, return the, you know, the results of the MySQL query, but it's going to store that value in the cache. And basically this is the, uh, the method to store in the cache. So we have a cache key and then we have a value and then we store it for, this is basically 12 hours and milliseconds because the, so basically the keys expire after 12 hours. So keys can expire, which means they get evicted. And also um, they, keys get evicted based on the least recent use algorithm as well. Okay. Now let, let's uh, test our application and see what happens when we introduce this cache. So how do we do this? We have to set this environment variable to true and then just run npm start. And now look at the read, let's see the read latency uh, when this value is cached. Now the first request is gonna have a high latency obviously because, um, because of um, the value hasn't been stored in cache yet, right? It's gonna be a cache miss the first time, but the second time around is gonna be a cache hit and we're gonna see the, the latency on that. So the first request, 80 milliseconds expected, high latency. Second request, it's gonna be 11 milliseconds. Now you see the logs here, the first one was a cache miss and the second was a cache hit because the first query, the first time it made the request, it made the query to the MySQL server, got the results, now storing in the cache and now we're retrieving from cache. Pretty cool, okay. So if we just keep on doing this, we see the latency um, drops Getting some cash hits here. Okay, much lower than on the other ones. Okay, so uh, now let's let's uh, test this theory out, right? Because um, what we want to see is, you know, we want to see it for an array of requests, right? Um, and uh, well, first of all, first of all, I want to talk about the pitfalls of this, right? So the pitfalls of uh, doing an in-memory solution is your data is reliant on your server. So your, 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 your application that's running on the server becomes a stateful application, which um, could be a good and bad thing. The bad thing about it is what happens if I kill the server, right? We lose all that data that's in the cache. Now you can imagine if you're running this in a production setting, and say you're relying on that in-memory solution, that's just bad. That's that's just bad design. You know, you don't want to do that because especially if, you know, you have a read heavy uh, sort of application. I mean, if you are doing an in-memory solution, like just using an LRU cache, you know, things happen, right? Your server can go down. Now, usually what you're going to be doing is you're going to be running multiple replicas of your server, multiple replicas of your application behind the load balancer, but even in that case, um, you, you, you're basically gonna be inconsistent because now each application has its own LRU cache, and but it's no telling which, uh, which um, the request from the client, which server it's gonna hit, right? So it's just all bad, all right? But, um, the, so that's the bad thing, right? Is, you know, it's totally reliant on the application running on that server, if that, server goes down, you lose all your data that's stored in the LRU cache. If your server, um, yeah, yeah, if your server goes down, you lose all that memory, okay? Um, the good thing about it is it's fast, right, to write, um, and it should only be used, like I said, in a caching, an in-memory cache, you know, basically making your application stateful should only be used if you have a backup, backup, backup plan, okay? So this should be not your primary source of cash, uh, your primary source of cash. Well, I mean, it's a, from perspective of the client, it might be the primary source, but from perspective of us as you know, backend developers, uh, first of all, the data database is the main source of truth. Okay, and then we might have multiple layers of caching before this in-memory solution. So then, say if the server goes down, we still have multiple layers of caching. And I'm gonna talk about those, which you can use a solution like Redis or Memcached, and I'm gonna talk about that, okay? So let's um, 
get some statistics on this, you know, running uh, sort of multiple requests, hitting, uh, you know, these endpoints and see statistics on, you know, when we're doing it with an in-memory cache and without, you know, so basically we're going to run what's called a load test on this solution versus that solution and compare the two, okay? So what we're going to do to run these load tests is, first of all, I'm going to start up my server here and we're going to use this tool called Siege, okay? So Siege is uh, essentially a load testing tool, um, HTTP load testing and benchmarking utility that can be used to measure the performance of a web server when under duress. Now, um, this is a very simple, lightweight load testing uh, tool, which that's why I like, you know, that's why I like to use it. Um, so I already have the command for brevity, but essentially uh, what it's doing here is it's reading from this URLs.txt file, which I wrote. Uh, it's just the list of endpoints that I want to hit. So I want to hit the software engineer, the accountant, and the doctor, and it's just running this load test for 30 seconds. So as soon as I hit this, we're going to see a lot of cache misses that's going to log out the standard output here um, because we're not hitting the database, right? So we're going to see, I mean, we're not hitting the cache. We're not caching it. We're just going to be going straight to the DB, right? The first uh, sort of diagram that you saw on my diagram. So this is going to run for 30 seconds. And like I said, we have a lot of cache misses that's logging out the standard out. So let this play out. Thirty seconds. Anticipation. Okay, so it says uh, the response time was average of tenth of a second, which is pretty good. It's not bad, right? The longest transaction was one point one zero seconds. So I mean, I don't know what happened there, but. You know, that's not good. Um, but it's not bad, though. You know, this is just pure database solution, right? Uh, so let's see what happens when we cache now. Now we should see a lot of cache hits, right? We're going to see a lot of cache misses in the beginning, but now when the, the cache is warm, you know, that it filled the cache from, uh, from requests from the client, we're going to see a lot of cache hits. All right, so then we're going to run this for 30 seconds. So... You saw like a lot of cash uh, misses, um, misses there in the beginning, but now we're seeing a lot of cash hits and we're just going to compare the two. So, you know, the ideal case here is the response time should be different. Like it should be lower. The average response time should be lower. Um, these might be, these might vary, but we're looking at that average response time right here, right? And look at this, it's 0 0.02. The longest transaction was actually longer. I mean, like I said, this is, these can just be outliers, but um, 0 0.02 for the caching solution, right? Which is pretty solid. So that's all I wanted to sort of explain to you, to y'all in this video. Um, I'm gonna talk about more caching techniques um, in subsequent videos. You know, I'm gonna talk about Redis. I'm gonna talk about, um, yeah, Redis has a server-side caching mechanism because, like I said, you can't just rely on your... I'm telling you, if you rely on in-memory solution, you're screwed. You're screwed. I don't know how else to, you know, bluntly say it. You're screwed because if your server goes down and you're having to read it, if your um, application or whatever your system is very read-heavy, finito. Like, you... <laughs> Chale, you done. So that's why I'll talk about Redis in another video. And then uh, we'll see how that can alleviate, you know, uh, sort of the issues that we see with just using a pure in-memory solution. But as far as like the read performance, the read latency is definitely a lot lower than, uh, or average, on average, right? It was a lot lower than uh, when we didn't uh, cache, right? So thank you all for listening uh, and hope to see you back. Please like, subscribe, comment, share. You feel me? We're trying to get this thing rocking. And uh, yeah, so I'll see y'all. Deuces.